Welcome to Stand Up for Doctors. I'm your host, Kim Downey. Thank you very much for joining us. I'd like to welcome Dr. Mark McLaughlin. Thanks for joining us today, Mark. Oh, my pleasure, Kim. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. I'm super excited for our conversation. And uh, I go ahead. I, I am too. Oh, great. So I usually start by saying how we met. And I looked back after we spoke briefly the other night, and I actually sent you a connection request back on July 19th on LinkedIn. And I said, I found you on SomiDocs. <laughs> and I just interviewed Donna Coriel the other day, the, both of your episodes, I'll be um, publishing them next week. So that's pretty interesting. And I said, we shared some mutual connections. And at this point, we share 358. <laughs> wow, excellent. That's yeah, a lot. I, yeah, I thought you'd be surprised to hear that. And then, so you accepted the request, but we didn't really communicate further until it was exactly five months later on December 19th. So I did send you a message saying I had just gotten off a call with Nate Cornell, and he mentioned that you were going to be the keynote speaker at the Physicians Financial Summit, which you're actually heading to right as to, almost as soon as we get off of this call. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And he, and he said that I'd want to meet you. So I sent you the message and then uh, and, and here we are. <laughs> it's great to meet you. And I'm so glad we got a chance to just talk a little bit before. So I got to know you a little bit. My goodness, you've had plenty of struggles in your life. Your remarkable, remarkable story. And um, thank you so much for helping doctors in this important way. It's just, it's just, so, so important to get these stories out there and to shine a light on physician burnout and physician suicide. And it's just, it's not something people like to talk about, but you have to talk about it to get through it. You're right. And I feel like I can't not do it. You know, I felt a calling after the the, the death of my doctor and uh, it just is so important. And that's why in sharing our stories is everything, right? And that's how we're all going to begin to heal, <laughs> That's why I'm so excited for this uh, event mm -hmm. tomorrow. You know, every time I get prepared for a talk, um, I try to make it a new one in in certain ways. And I have some stories, which, you know, I'll share with you. But but really, I learn so much from these talks. I that's what that's what I really enjoy about the the the, the teaching is you actually learn the most. And so I'm just excited to uh, to speak with everybody out there. And and um, and again, you know, to talk about you know, what are the, what, what we think are the causes of burnout and how we define it. And then what are, what, what are the prevention tips or what are the cures that you can have to, uh, to deal with it appropriately? Right. Yeah. Well, I love that. And I would love to, to hear more. And um, so by way of uh, briefly introducing you, introducing you a bit more formally, um, Dr. McLaughlin is a neurosurgeon, storyteller, and coach connecting people with purpose and inspiring patients, athletes, leaders, and doctors through service. I love that. I love when you word that. And uh, he's also, you're welcome. And he's also a speaker and author of Cognitive Dominance, A Brain Surgeon's Quest to Outthink Fear. And uh, today I thought we'd begin our conversation by talking about uh, the theme of your book, and we'll take it from there. So as we get started, what would you most like our audience to know about you? Well, that, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I'm not an expert at any of this. I'm, I'm an advanced student, maybe, maybe just a student, but I like to share what I've learned with people because, it, you know, it's taken me 30 years to, to acquire this knowledge and I'm hoping that I can pass it on to people so they can, they can fast track it. And so that book that I wrote about five years ago um, you know, the, the person who learned the most from that book was me. And it, it really transformed my, the way I thought about myself and about my career. And I don't think it's necessary for everyone to write a book to come to that realization. Um, but it is important to be self-reflective. It is important to, you know, look at the events in your life and look at what your purpose is in life and to really make sense of it. You know, I was a philosophy major in college. I thought it was the coolest thing, you know, to talk about the, you know, meaning and to understand, you know, what is a, what is a fruitful, you know, uh, joyful life. So that, you know, and I thought that would help me as a doctor too, if I had some more liberal arts background. 
So, you know, the, 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 the book was, was really my path towards, you know, awakening some very important feelings and, and really a, a love of medicine and my patients that, uh, that was very profound for me. Hmm. Well, I think it's all fascinating. And even the fact that I, I believe a lot of, um, students wanting to get into med school choose um like chemistry or something right is <laughs> there biology as a major and uh and you did i've, I've read a little about you and that from a, uh, the age of a child right that you did uh, always want to be a doctor so that you chose philosophy so i think that's very interesting yeah i thought it would you know it would add to you know my repertoire and it's it's helped me think and write and speak about you know, the events in medicine, I, I learned a new topic recently, there's a, a an area of medicine called narrative medicine. Mm -hmm. And it's become, you know, it's become, uh, you know, really popular in the last few years. And I think it's because physicians have stories to tell, and that sharing can be very therapeutic, and it can also be enlightening. Uh, and that's really, you know, my my theme at this talk uh, uh, tomorrow is going to be that you know, you need to feel it, you need to share it, and you need mm -hmm. to bring it. And those are the important points that that I'm going to make. And I can give you the sneak peek because this is going to be published after the uh, the event. Um, but you know, the the <clears throat> the neat thing is that your patients teach you these stories. You know, as a doctor, mm -hmm. you have these special relationships with people, and they teach you very very interesting uh, interesting points about yourself. So, you know, one of the uh, people I talk about is a, a young boy named Anthony. And Anthony uh, rolled into the emergency room just as I was starting my career in Springfield, Massachusetts. He had fallen off a school bus and he had cut his chin. And I had just driven in from our, our new home. We had moved up there with my young family. And I went in to see him. And the ER doctor had gotten a scan because his parents said, you know, he's not acting right. He's been clumsy. He's mm -hmm. been falling. So they, uh, they got a, a CAT scan and lo and behold, it showed a brain tumor. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I saw Anthony in the ER and he was this cute curly haired kid who, you know, had a great sense of humor and was joking with the nurses. And, you know, he just, you could tell he had this magnetism to him. And uh, immediately became attached to him. And I looked at his scans and I had all the training. I had been, you know, to a very strong residency program and done a lot of work in pediatric neurosurgery. And mm -hmm. I, I felt confident I could fix him. And I was excited to fix him. I so, talked to his parents. Mom and dad owned a pizza parlor down the street. And uh, that's when they picked up uh, that he was clumsy because he was dropping plates and things when he was mm -hmm. bussing tables. And he was... You know, he was dad's number one helper at the restaurant. So I said, we can fix him. You know, I'm going to get your little boy back to you. And I took him to the operating room a day or two later. The surgery went beautifully, um, got the tumor out, and uh, he woke up perfectly. Mm -hmm. um, he was back to his normal self. And I thought, man, I, I just love neurosurgery. I just love this, man. Medicine is so awesome. Mm -hmm. And then 24 hours later, he deteriorated mm -hmm. and he developed a condition where he had trouble with his speech and trouble moving, uh, which was very uncomfortable for him. And we scanned him. His scans looked okay, but he had developed a, a rare complication that, that was characterized by these symptoms. Mm -hmm. And I had to talk with mom and dad and go over the, the, the complication with them, um, tried to reassure them. And, um, and then I thought, you know, that was going to be the, the end of it and he would get back to himself. Mm -hmm. But then another issue happened where he developed a fluid buildup on the brain and he got very sick very fast. And we had to put an emergency drain in him so that he wouldn't, uh, wouldn't die. Mm -hmm. uh, he became that sick. And a few days later, the pathology came back, which was not good. Mm. And a series of through a series of complications, I saw this young, beautiful boy slip away from us. And mm. I saw the, each of these events being um, insults to his brain and really, really causing him harm. 
And um, after a while, uh, the complications became so severe, I realized he was never going to be the same. Mm -hmm. And it, it wasn't just the complications. He really, he really suffered. Mm -hmm. He suffered. Mm -hmm. So it was very challenging for me. And um, especially when I had a healthy four children at home. Mm -hmm. Um, But finally he, he stabilized and uh, he was discharged from the hospital and about three months later, and uh, mom and dad were such, they were such sweet people. They, they took up, they once said, we want to take a picture of you and Anthony. So I mm-hmm. took a picture with him. Um, but I, um, I wasn't happy. At the, I faked the smile yeah. because I knew there was nothing good coming to this kid. He had to get radiation. He had to get chemotherapy and his life was turned totally upside down. And uh, he left the hospital, but he did not leave me. Mm -hmm. And uh, over the next few months, I began playing that case back over in my head, wondering if there was something I could have done differently, wondering if I had retracted too much on the brain and caused that injury that he had, or it could have picked up the fluid buildup earlier and he didn't have that insult or any of the others. I tried to rethink everything and I kept coming up with, I should have done a better job. I could have done a better job. And it really got under my skin. And um, of course I didn't share this with anybody, you know, I, I kept it to myself. I, I pretended like I was okay, but I suppressed him and I suppressed all those thoughts and I drank, you know, scotch at the end of the day. And I smoked cigars and chewed tobacco and would go for these long walks by myself, just kind of wondering like, what is the meaning of, of this? Why, mm-hmm. how could, why do I get to have a healthy young boy and, and poor Anthony's parents have this upside down life that they have now. And, um, and I just began to really wonder like, what, well, wh- why would, why, why well, how capricious this world is. Mm-hmm. And I ultimately, the, the feelings were so uncomfortable. I, I avoided them. I suppressed them. And I ultimately, I, I, I left town. I stopped doing neurosurgery and I moved about a year, year and a half later. And I tried to, you know, not think of Anthony. Mm -hmm. Um, But I had his picture. His parents gave me that picture and that picture was on my office wall. And every time I went by it, it would remind me of Anthony. And when I started writing this book, 16 years later, I started um, thinking about him again and I, I got on Facebook and I looked up the the pizza parlor that the parents had, and I saw the mom and dad were there and the pizza parlor was still there. So I started scrolling down a little bit more and I saw a picture of this 23 year old man with his mom and dad. He was in a wheelchair. He was at Rockefeller center, but he was there. And I thought, Oh my gosh, he's still alive. I, I didn't think he'd, would have ever survived. So I picked up the phone and I called the pizza parlor right away. And I talked to the dad and I said, I'm I'm writing this book and I want to, I want to come up and talk with you. And I, I drove up there that weekend and I talked with mom and dad and I visited with Anthony and Anthony clearly has some neurological challenges. Um, And we, but he was with us and and we, Mm -hmm. we had a conversation and when I talked with mom and dad, I told myself, I'm writing this book and I, I always wanted to tell you something. Mm. I, I wanted to tell you that I, I always felt like I let you down because I didn't bring your boy back to you. And they're just such beautiful people. I mean, they just, they just jumped across the table and gave me this big hug and said, what are you kidding me? You saved our boy. He's with us today. He's still my number one guy. And that day, like all of those feelings finally came back to me and there was this profound sadness and then this profound joy that I had, that I had reached out to them and then I had reconnected with them and then I had seen him. And, and I, you know, I learned on that day that all of my avoiding and all of my suppressing and all of my, you know, drinking and chewing tobacco and smoking and all that stuff 
was trying to anesthetize myself from the feelings right and that and that avoiding the feelings was worse right it was worse than feeling them right then the only way i was ever going to get over this was to go through it and that was just a profound lesson for me and um and i i think that physicians you know we're we're trained at, at times to you know to disconnect or to create a separation or to not um, be invested in our patients and in an emotional way. Right. And, you know, I think that thinking for me was all wrong. It was mm -hmm. all wrong. And I, I really had to feel all of that the, for me to get through it. And now, you know, when I tell that story, it doesn't use me anymore. I, I use it mm -hmm. and I get right. stronger from that story. You know, it's right. something I call terrible knowledge. Uh, terrible knowledge was defined by a psychologist by the name of Jeffrey J. And uh, it's this, it's this knowledge that the world can be, can do can, horrible things can happen in this world. And yet you still have to go on and, and live your life and, and make a meaning out of it. Mm -hmm. So that terrible knowledge now is no longer using me. I'm using it. And mm -hmm. it's, it's caused me to completely rethink my career and my, my purpose on earth. So it was a great, it was a great, great lesson and experience. And in one day, the most um, catastrophic patient I had in my career right. became the best patient I ever had in my career. Yeah, And I still keep in touch with him I, and his father and we talk and um, it's wonderful. It's, it's wonderful. And it's the greatest gift you could ever have in medicine is to have those kinds of relationships with patients. Right. Well, thank you so much for sharing this story. It's amazing. And this is so important. And this is where the healing happens is, you know, is uh doctor sharing their stories, right? And exactly. uh, I've said multiple times that, you know, every time a doctor shares their story, another doctor feels less alone. And yes. what's so interesting is I enlisted for, because um, I think I might have told you that doctors tell me like the connecting doctors is like one of my superpowers, that when I talk to a doctor, I yeah. just know who they'd like to be connected with. So I had written like four names for you. And just during your talk, all four of them came to mind, you know, just through what you were saying. So one of them is um Dr. Simon Craig. He's a OBGYN in Australia who left that to he's doing coaching systems and he wrote this book from hurting to healing, delivering love to medicine and healthcare. And I recently had um him on uh, one of my episodes and he talked about how, you know, how doctors are learned how, you know, to suppress their feelings and he's like which is okay in an emergency but not okay for the rest of your life. Like just what you're saying. So right in that yeah. moment, while you're doing the surgery, it's important to tune those other things out, but then you need to process them. And, uh, and then another physician is Dr. Michael Hirsch is my physician coach. And he does talk to about like, you have to feel all of the feelings, you know, just like what you said. And I think even me myself, because we would, uh, I've had similar situations where I went up to a NICU and a baby that had, you know, lived a hundred days before, uh, um, and before and she died before she was due to be born. And you go up there and all of her stuff is gone and you want to just cry, but it's only seven o'clock. You're doing rounds in the morning, right before you have a whole day of patience. So then you just have to go and you don't talk about these things. And, uh, and that's really important. And then, um, Dr. Tony Avellino, is a pediatric neurosurgeon and he I actually was just communicating with him a little last night um and he wrote a book uh finding purpose and neurosurgeon's journey um because in his book he wrote it's not the hundreds of kids lives you save that keep you up at night it's the few that you don't whether through an honest you know mistake or just the disease process and he, um, you know, came very close, he shares, you know, to taking his life, and he was able to reverse it. And now, just by sharing that story, and it's the feelings that you have, and everybody's walking around thinking, you know, it's just me, or I'm the only one that did that. And that's not true. 
And just the last one before I let you continue is uh, I wanted to tell you, Dr. David Alfrey, he's a retired anesthesiologist in Nashville, and he wrote a book called Saving Grace, What Our Patients Teach Us About Life, Death, and the Balance in Between. And he shares some stories, you know, in, in somewhat, some ways similar, you know, a bit uh, to what you shared. And um, it's, yeah, but but just like... Thank you for the work you do because we need people to to do this work, <laughs> and we might Thank be circling you. back a bit to talk about um like your book Cognitive Dominance of Brain Surgeons Quest to Outthink Fear. So can you speak to that a little how it relates to what you just said and how you got back to uh, neurosurgery? Well, you mentioned the word sharing, and and really that's you know I said you got to feel it, you got to share it. And you, you mentioned that as well. So on that same night, when I was driving back after visiting with Anthony's parents, I called my editor because we were, we had already we were working on the book. And um, I said to him, you know, I, I said, you know, you're never going to believe this story. And um, and we had already we had already told another story about a person who had um, who had had a, a fractured dislocation of their neck and they were paralyzed. And I, I operated on that person and they recovered remarkably well. And so we had already talked about that story. And I, and I talked about how lucky I was and how I was a lucky doctor and he was a lucky surgeon. I was a lucky surgeon. And he was a lucky patient. And my editor said, okay, well, we're going to put Anthony's story in with this other person's story. His name was Jesus. We're going to put those two stories together. And I said, wait a minute, hold on. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, how do they, how do they go together? And he said, you don't, you don't get it, do you? And I was like, what, what am I supposed to get? He said, and this, this it totally blew my mind. He said, Mark, you take somebody who's paralyzed and you make them well and walk again. And you say it's luck. And then you have a young boy who has a terrible tumor and a bad outcome and you say it's your fault. Mm -hmm. That is an impossible standard to live up to. Right. Like on that one night, that perspective, that I had one perspective of mm -hmm. Anthony. By sharing my perspective with somebody else and getting another person's perspective, mm -hmm. I, I saw a bigger picture. You know, we tell ourselves a story but that story is based right. on the facts that we perceive through our filter only. Right. We don't, we, we, ha we don't listen to other people. We don't, you know, we don't let other people when we're alone, we keep it to ourselves. We're not getting other people's perspectives mm -hmm. by giving yourself permission to get another person's perspective. You can totally see something in a very different light. Right. And on that night, like that completely transformed the way I thought about myself as a doctor. And one night I had two mm. experiences that were just, I mean, it was ecstasy really, because mm. I, I, I felt something that I needed to feel. And I realized something that I had to real. And on that night, I became so much better of a doctor, so much more effective as a physician and as a person too. Mm -hmm. right. So sharing. Editor. Absolutely. Yeah. Sharing is absolutely mm -hmm. key. You know, we have a, 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 a saying that was taught to me by Gail Rousseau. She's a wonderful neurosurgeon and friend. And um, she taught me when I, was a, when I was a student, never worry about a patient alone. Mm -hmm. And that is a great adage for life. Like never worry about anything alone. Mm -hmm. Talk to people about it, yeah, get different so cool. perspectives. They may have answers. They may not have answers, but you're going to get different pieces of information and different perspectives, which is going to help you function and be more effective. Absolutely. And that's the message I try to get across like over and over again. And, uh, and on my LinkedIn page, I've shared, you know, risk free and confidential resources for physicians. And then in podcasts, you know, I've talked about, uh, and, and, and with Kevin MD, actually, we're recording one um, or later this morning, and it's about having crucial conversations with the uh, doctors having crucial conversations with their patients. And I'm going to be doing that with uh, Dr. Frances May Harden. She's an ENT in Nashville. Uh -huh. 
So uh -huh. I'm wondering if she um has a a, a website uh, rethinking residency. She's she's working on supporting residents, and she thinks um that they need to learn a lot of these things. And I wonder if you have anything to speak to that. Um, do you have any tips for like young attendings or residents on having crew? Because you've obviously had plenty of experience of that, having to have crucial conversations with uh, patients or their families. Well, that brings me really to my last point, which is you got to, I said, you got to feel it. You got to share it. You got to bring it. And when I say bring it, I mean, really learned this from another patient. I was getting ready to do um, a, an operation on a patient that had a brain tumor. I'm, I'm idling in my car in the parking lot the day of the surgery. It's late afternoon. It's a Friday. I'm pretty tired. I've had, you know, seen 60 patients that week. I've done six operations. This is the last one of the day. It was supposed to start at 11, but it got pushed to 2.30 which you know is not a great time to be starting a big case because mm -hmm. the person that sets the table for the surgery is going to be going off at three and you're going to get what's called a handoff mm -hmm. and a handoff, you know, you have a person who's technically competent and they know what to do and how to help you, but they haven't set the table. They don't, they don't have the same feel. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, in surgery is like a dance, you know, you really need to be moving and, 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 and in synchrony and harmony. So it's late in the afternoon. A case has been pushed back. It's a difficult tumor. Uh, it's a tumor in a patient who has a tumor in the back of their head, right around a very important vein. And I haven't done one of these in a while because I had a brand new tumor surgeon in the, in the practice and he was doing most of the tumors. Mm -hmm. I had done them many times in the past, but nothing yeah. recently. So it's kind of like, you know, an expert chef can do lobster thermidor anytime they want, but if they haven't done it in six months, they probably need to think about it a little bit sure, more. Sure. So same thing, same thing, not, not to belittle what I'm doing, but mm -hmm. really it's, it's, it's really like you have to focus. And mm -hmm. because I hadn't done it in a while, it was a little added stress. Mm -hmm. And um, so as I'm getting ready to go in the hospital to do this, um, when I'm tired, uh, when the day is late, when I'm doing something I'm a little bit uh, uh, uncomfortable with, I get a phone call and the phone call is from my father's doctor. My father hadn't been feeling well for a couple of days. And um, he told me that my father had AML, which is basically a death sentence for somebody who's 88. And uh, you know, I was really close with my father and he lived about an hour away. And I, I heard this, minutes before I was going to do this surgery. And I thought, how can you possibly keep your head in the game? You know, we talked about tuning things out, but sure. this was something that I wasn't going to be able to tune out. I, I, you know, I've realized early on, it's hard to compartmentalize these things. You, you, I think you bring them all with you, wherever you go, you may fool yourself a little bit, but that, that I believe is true. So I thought, I can't, I'm not going to do this. I can't, I can't like, I'm going to cancel the surgery. I'll do it tomorrow or the next day I'll get regroup and I'll get some things in order. And so I decided I was going to go in and cancel it. So I walked into the hospital and I'm walking down the hallway to see this patient. And I see him down the hallway and it's this gentleman and his wife is at his bedside and his three kids are at his bedside, his three girls. And they're looking at me and I'm walking in thinking, I'm going to cancel this. Mm -hmm. You know, and I thought to myself, you know, my dad needs me right now and I want to go see him and give him a hug. But these people need me right now. Mm -hmm. They need me right now. And as I walked in the room, it was almost like this ghost in my mind I, I remembered this poem that my father had given me years ago, Rudyard Kipling's If, and I remembered, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. And I thought, man, I, I'm not going to cancel this surgery. I'm going to dedicate it to my father. Mm. I'm not throwing the towel in. I'm going to make this a monument to him. And I took that man back to the operating room. I shook his hand, took him back to the operating room and did the surgery 
And it was one of the best surgeries I've ever done in my life. Mm -hmm. He woke up perfectly. And once I knew he was awake and safe, I went to go visit my father. Mm -hmm. And um, what I learned from that one was there's no meaning to hearing about your father getting ALS and having a death sentence. There's no meaning to having a brain tumor. It's, it's certainly not a triumph, but it's not a disaster either. It's just something you have to work through in the present moment. Mm -hmm. And what I realized was that how was I going to put, how was meaning going to come to me from this? It wasn't, I had to put meaning into it. And so when I say bring it, that's what I mean is that people are looking and physicians are looking for inspiration from medicine. I think I had that all wrong. I have to bring the inspiration to medicine. Mm -hmm. It's that way. It goes that way. And when you look in within yourself, that's where the meaning comes from. You create the meaning. And so when I say you got to feel it, you got to share it and you got to bring it. The it is you. Mm -hmm. You have to bring you. You have to feel you. You have to feel you. You have to share you. And when you do, greatness happens. You feel more alive and you love what you do and you love your patients and you love your family more. And so if I was speaking to residents, I would say, you can't live and die by your outcomes. It's not great to be high on the big ones and it's not great to be low on the low ones. The outcomes are the outcomes. Mm -hmm. The only thing you can do is focus on bringing yourself to every event and being the person that you've chosen to be. For me, that's a servant. I'm a servant mm -hmm. and my job is to serve people and I'm lucky and grateful that I get to serve people in a really intimate way and in a really important way. So that would be my advice. You got to feel it, share it and bring it. And the, it is you. Mm. Well, thank you. That's really, really powerful. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm just so happy that we were able to have this conversation. I feel like I could talk to you all day long. We might have to do a follow-up one. <laughs> oh, well, I'd yeah. be happy to. At some point, thank you. Cause I, yeah, I, there's so much to learn from you. Cause I had a whole lot of notes of things that we could have talked about. And, uh, but I know that we have to be winding down now and you have a plane to catch. Um, so uh, how can our listeners get in touch with you? So my, uh, my Instagram page is M McLaughlin MD. And um, my website is markmclaughlinmd.com. And there's a place to uh, comment or, or get in touch with me if you need to. Um, and, uh, and my YouTube channel is Mark McLaughlin MD. And that would be another way to see some more of this stuff. Most of the stories I've told you are in my book, Cognitive Dominance, which you can get on Amazon. And I have a number of my talks that are uh, on YouTube, my YouTube channel. Thank you. And I um, watch some of the things on your YouTube channel and I really love, um, I love it. <laughs> it's Thanks. fantastic. Thank even you. for the average person to see, you know, what it's like to scrub in for a surgery and what's going through your mind and, and all of those things. It's, it's super interesting. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank so, you. It's, it's, yeah. it's been a pleasure speaking with you, Kim. Yeah, well, you well, you as well. And um, best of luck at this Physicians Financial Summit. Um, you're going to be seeing, you know, all my friends there, you know, Mike and Nate and uh, Todd <laughs> and Donna. And uh, I'll have to have Nate on, too. He's the only one. They've all already been on here. So, uh, uh, so I think it'll be fantastic. I can't wait to hear about it. And um, so uh, in closing, to move the needle in healthcare. We all need to raise our voices and we all need to care about each other. We already know that doctors need to care about patients. Patients need to care about doctors too. So stand up doctors and let's stand up for doctors. <laughs>